please welcome to the stage Dr. Janendra Ranka. Hello, I'm part of the Defense Science Office at DARPA. Um, called DSO. In DSO, we have a number of efforts related to quantum computing. You heard Mark Rosker from MTO talk about some of the efforts um, earlier this morning. We have a number of entangled talks today if you're uh, into quantum funds. And we focus on everything from the fundamental building blocks of quantum systems all the way to um, uh, the individual components. And understanding the potential impacts of quantum computing is a hard problem. It is one of the big questions that we have at DARPA. Now, if you speak to physicists across the country, about half of them are convinced that quantum computers will be the most important technology of the 21st century, that they will revolutionize every one of the topics you see on the screen and more. There's a tremendous amount of commercial investment based on this viewpoint. Now, the other half is convinced that it's not possible to build a large-scale quantum computer. And even if you could, it is not going to be able to solve a problem that a classical supercomputer would not be able to solve. It's a battle between Planck's constants and Boltzmann constants. Now, in the next few minutes, I'm going to try to give you a sense of why the first group might be right. Why might quantum computers be able to solve a unique set of computational problems? Um, and it could be everything that you think about. I mean, there was a paper a few days ago about a holographic wormhole. But I'm going to give you a little more concrete example. One example of nitrogen fixation. Now, you might be asking, of all those revolutionary problems, you know, a holographic wormhole is quite you know, interesting. But nitrogen fixation is interesting because you'd be surprised to learn that approximately 1% to 2% of the global energy supply is just used in smashing together nitrogen and hydrogen at um, extremely high temperatures and pressures to make ammonia to make fertilizers. Not 1% of San Diego's energy supply, not 1% of California's, but 1% of the global energy supply. Now, the Haber-Bosch process is over 100 years old, and very little has changed. Improvements in efficiency would have a major impact, not only in the production of fertilizer, but also in the potential of using ammonia as a fuel in a renewable energy ecosystem. Now, we know that nature does this in a while at perfectly normal temperatures and pressures using an enzyme called nitrogenase. Yet we have very little insight on how to replicate this in an industrial scale. And that's really key in an industrial scale process. Now, the reason is that if you think about this enzyme, this little tinker toy in the foreground, well, you could just ask, how does this thing bend and push the hydrogen and nitrogen together? Well, you think it'd be relatively straightforward to figure out how this works, but the molecules are quantum mechanical objects. So this molecule, like all other molecules, can exist in multiple shapes at the same time. What's more is that the number of different shapes that can exist at the same time grows exponentially with the number of atoms in the molecule. It's not even a factor of choosing which one of the shapes is ideal to make this work. It needs to simultaneously exist in just the right combination of hundreds and thousands or billions of shapes at the same time, so just the right way to pull off this chemical magic trick. That's why classical computers cannot um, solve this problem. So what if we try to build a computer that had the same capabilities to solve the same problem? And that goes into the quantum bit. A quantum bit is different than a classical bit. A classical bit is a one or a zero or a yes or a no. A quantum bit is a zero or a one or can be an infinite state of shades of maybe. We normally think about these states as living inside of a quantum sphere. So for example, if you had an electron spin, you can measure up, down, left, right, front, back. You always get one of two answers. But in a very real sense, it exists in all of those states at the same time. Now, if you put together a bunch of these, you get the same behavior in a way we saw before where the number of possible measurements you could get from a quantum computer scales the same way as a classical computer. But it can take on an exponentially growing number of states and exist in all of them at the same time. There is reason to believe that because of this, a quantum computer might be able to solve hard problems the same with the same mathematical characteristics. So where are we in this problem? Well, we've been able to build quantum computers that can solve problems that no classical computer can solve. But what we haven't been able to build is quantum computers that can solve useful problems. We have programs, as Mark said, such as US2QC and quantum benchmarking that specifically look at this. We don't know the time scales to go from really difficult, really impressive science experiments to honest to goodness, change the world, quantum supercomputers. Will quantum computers be revolutionary? Well, um, the uh, program managers in, in the office, and probably around 20, 25% of our program managers are thinking of quantum in some fashion or another. They like to look at it in different examples. If you think about it back over 100 years ago with the first flight, 
that proved a point that humans could fly. You didn't know where it was going to go from that. It was going to revolutionize travel. Would it be flying cars? There are dead ends that we would go through. Or that it would inspire people to say, we can fly, we can go to the moon. To some degree, quantum computers are on the same point, that we are demonstrating what is possible. We don't know what is going to be there in the future, but we're investigating them. We're investigating them with programs that look at benchmarking for quantum computers. We're investigating to look at the potential of quantum computers, both on the government side as the commercial side. And after lunch, um, again, this is a quantum entitled, uh, entangled talk, I'll be talking about a new um, effort that we released last week, specifically looking for ideas on the next generation of quantum computers. And if you have ideas, we really would like to get your help in that area. Thank you very much.